Born Eugene Vidal on October 3rd, 1925, the man who eventually changed his name to Gore Vidal went on to become one of the most outspoken and eloquent critics of U.S. empire, wealth, and power. Gore Vidal was a prominent social critic, novelist, playwright, screenwriter, and essayist. John Keats once praised him as the 20th century's finest essayist. He spent many years living in Italy with his partner Howard Oster and moved back to Southern California in the last few years of his life. Gore Vidal ran for office, hobnobbed with movie stars and musicians, was blacklisted by the literary establishment, criticized all wars and presidents, and threw great parties. He died nearly two years ago on July 31, 2012, leaving behind a legacy that is almost impossible to capture in one coherent narrative. That is, until now. The new documentary, Gore Vidal, The United States of Amnesia, is the definitive encapsulation of more than 50 years of the life of an American unlike any other. Nicholas Ruthol, the film's producer, writer, and director, now joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Thank you. Nice to be here. And that clip that we just heard from your film, many uh, such gems dropped by Gore Vidal over the years, was, of course, his uh, take on presidents and his lead up to Ronald Reagan, whom he liked to refer to as a cue card reader. Let's first talk about uh, the early influences on Gore Vidal. Many of us sort of know about the later Gore Vidal, but uh, in your film, you're pretty chronological. He mm. talks about how much he disliked his mother, but how much he loved and looked up to his grandfather, a man who was a senator from Oklahoma. How deeply did Gore Vidal's grandfather influence his politics and also his later political ambitions? Um, I think his grandfather was probably the most influential figure on him growing up. You know, he was sort of taken under his grandfather's wing when his parents were divorced and, and grew up, uh, you know, worked as a sort of page for his grandfather, taking him to the Senate floor. His grandfather was a very famous blind senator, a great orator, a first senator for Oklahoma, and uh, T.P. Gore was his name. And Gore, you know, I think his opinions and his ethics were formed very at a very young age um, under the wing of his grandfather. I think he, his grandfather uh, inspired him throughout his life. You know, it, he was sort of groomed for politics, and as you mentioned, he did run for office, but I think in the end he decided that writing was his destiny and that was where his power was and that you know he could be the uncompromising voice that he that he wanted to be if and wouldn't was i think if he went into politics it, it, there would have been compromises so i think his grandfather you know was character forming in his in his early life definitely so he burst onto the literary scene at the tender age of 19 after coming back from fighting in world war ii it was a novel called will of war but then three years later his second novel the city and the pillar was essentially the start of him being blacklisted by the establishment press because it was the first to openly depict homosexual sex between two men how serious um a blow was this to uh vidal's literary career that at that time seemed so promising. I think it was pretty serious for him in that, like you said, he was a promising young writer. He, this was his second novel, uh, and the New York Times refused famously to advertise it, to review it, and even said that they wouldn't even read any of his future novels. And so Gore, um, at that time, decided to sort of move out, to, right after that, to move out to Hollywood and got involved in screenplay writing and was sort of working on the studio system at the time. He wrote Ben-Hur. <laughs> he was uh, sort of rewrote Ben-Hur right. and he did a lot of screenplay writing in the studio system. But, you know, I think his idea at the time was that he could go out, come out here and work and make money and then he could go back and buy a property and write whatever he wanted to do. Right. As it turned out, The City and the Pillar, uh, you know, it was printed in, it was an early paperback and was widely available and he did make quite a lot of money and it sold, it was almost like bestseller. But critically, he was kind of squashed by the establishment. Mm. Eventually, he wrote another controversial book, Myra Breckenridge, about a transgender woman. And I'm wondering, did the fact that he'd been rejected by the establishment over the city and the pillar kind of free him to be as radical, for his time at least, as he wanted to be? Um, I think it did. I think, you know, but... His career is interesting because he'd also written some serious historical novels mm -hmm. well before he got into writing Myra of Breckenridge. And, you know, he was sort of following his own path. You know, he wanted to, he had a lot of different things he was exploring. 
Um, but I think you've seen his public persona too, even in the 60s, even before my Breckenridge came out, that he was very outspoken uh, about homosexuality and he was sort of out from an early age um, in terms of his own life. He was, uh, you know, since the city of the pillar, he'd always sort of lived his life and, and sort of held his ground in debate about, you know, what his rights were as a man to choose his, his own lifestyle. And I think the, you know, when Myra Breckenridge came out, it, it really, again, shook up, it was in the atmosphere of the 60s, but it shook up the sort of sexual mores that were still hanging over from the 50s and really shocked a lot of people. But it did bring, um, you know, some serious kind of discussions, I think, out into the light around queer politics, transsexualism, and just, you know, general sexuality. And <laughs> One of the highlights of uh, the film and, and really important part of Gore Vidal's career were his um, jousting, if you will, with William F. Buckley. Um, he, he and Buckley famously sparred on television um, and perhaps the most dramatic exchange was one where um, Gore Vidal comments on the anti-Vietnam War movement and, and the Viet Cong and then Buckley interrupts him and Vidal calls him a crypto Nazi, at which point Buckley loses his temper, calls him a queer, and threatens to, quote, sock him in the face. Let's take a listen. What are we doing fighting in Vietnam if you cannot freely express yourself in the streets of Chicago? Can you play it out over the head speakers? Can you play it out over the speakers? The over the speakers for the video. They were beating up delegates to the Democratic Convention. And behaving like the pigs that they were known as. And I was against the pigs and said so. Well, the people in the United States uh, happen to believe that the United States policy is wrong in Vietnam and the Viet Cong are correct in wanting to organize their country in their own way politically. This happens to be pretty much the opinion of Western Europe and many other parts of the world. If it is a novelty in Chicago, that is too bad. But I assume that the point of the American democracy is yeah. that you can express any point of view you want. Shut up a minute. No, I won't. And some people were not on that thing, and the answer is that they were, they were well treated by people who ostracized them, and I'm for ostracizing people who egg on other people to shoot American Marines and American soldiers. That's I know you don't as care. As far as I'm concerned, the only sort of pro-crypto uh, Nazi okay. I can think of is yourself. I Failing think. that, I would only let's say that we can't have. Now listen, you the right yeah, of the Stop calling me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop oh, calling names you in your goddamn face. Let's you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, oh, let's go. Let me let let my Bracken's Bracken go back to his pornography and stop making any allusions of Nazi. I beg you to. You were not in the last war. You were not in the last I was in the second war. I was in the second war. I was in the famous brawl between uh, William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal on television um, that uh, devolved to name calling. This became TV history, of course, but the, these two men had many TV encounters. How well did Gore Vidal articulate the, the left wing position on political topics uh, against the conservative establishment that Buckley represented? Was he, the, was he really one of the few voices in the media at that time that could articulate the position of people on the streets? Um, you know, I think in, in those particular debates, Gore did a very good job of articulating the position of the left. And, you know, he was up against a sort of formidable character in Buckley who, who um, you know, saw himself, I guess they saw each other as rivals, as equals, one from the left, one from the right, for both very aristocratic figures in a sense. But, um, you know, the... Yeah, I think Gore articulated that position very well. And if you look at those debates, they're fascinating because there's literally four or six debates of half hour each. Hmm. We only have a few minutes in the film, but you could make a whole film on those debates. And, and they're fascinating. And many of the subjects, many of the debate back and forth between the two are feel very prescient, subjects that feel like they're still in the public d discourse today. Right. You know, they're talking about, Gore's talking about, you know, the, the ruling classes and the corporate control of media. And, and he government. brings up wealth inequality, too. 20% of the people on the top have, uh, or 5% of the people on the top have 20% of the wealth. And, uh, and here we are yeah. today, you know, with the 1%, <laughs> yeah. the 99% as wealth accelerates upwards. You know, it's, it's interesting that Gore was actually a big fan and supporter of the Occupy movement. I think he was. He told me he was very motivated to see young people out in the streets right. and framing that discussion again. Yeah, um, and 
there he was framing it in the 60s, right. and we're, we're in the same issues today. Now, uh, he had a very interesting position on presidents. Uh, Gore Vidal had a relationship with John F. Kennedy that was quite interesting. They were good friends, and Vidal ran for the House of Representatives at the same time as JFK ran for president. They sort of campaigned together occasionally. JFK won, but Vidal did not. And Gore Vidal said later of JFK that he became, I'm paraphrasing, one of the most disastrous American presidents, particularly over Kennedy's decision to embroil the U.S. in the Vietnam War. And I'm wondering, what did his position on JFK say about his view of, of power and the presidency in general? Well, I, interestingly, um, before we started here, you were mentioning the, the 2008 election of Obama mm -hmm. and your interview with Gore. And I was with Obama. I was with Gore that night that Obama was elected. And you see in the film, you know, he's quite. Even though he was a bit of a fan of Obama and obviously supported the Democrats, he did was very dismissive in the sense that he didn't believe that the that he could make a difference and that the office of president, you know, that that person could have the integrity to sort of move in the direction they'd like to. And, you know, famously he said about Kennedy, which is in the film, don't be taken in by his charm. Right. And I think he felt the same way about Obama. And, and that was really the bottom line for him, I think. He felt like Kennedy was a very charming man, interesting man. They were friends, but he was, in his eyes, a disastrous president that led the U.S. into Vietnam. And in a sense, I think he was always quite cynical about the office of president in that the real power lay elsewhere. Mm. And he said uh, often something to the effect of anybody who wants to run for president should be immediately disqualified from doing so. Uh, he was very patrician in his style and language. You mentioned earlier, like Buckley, had the sort of aristocratic background. He came from a family of wealth and power, although he earned his money through his screenplays. He, did, he lived on this dreamy villa uh, much of his adult life in, in Italy, overlooking this amazing body of water. I mean, we might imagine that's how the 1% live. How important was this contradiction that Vidal came from the very world that he often criticized? You know, I think that was um, sort of where the seat of his power and our interest lies in Gore, because in some ways he was a class traitor. You know, he was someone that came from the inside of the Beltway, that grew up in a political family, and then was crit critiquing them, criticizing them, uh, sort of exposing them for who they were, showing the real interests and the machinations and motivations of power from the inside, which is a rare view that we don't really get to see very often. And he'd grown up with, you know, Huey Long at his grandfather's table and, and really seen the way that these people strategized. Mm. And yeah, and, and I should mention the film features uh, people who knew Gore Vidal intimately, his own sister, his nephew, his friends like uh, Tim Robbins and uh, Jody Evans and others. Um, finally, very briefly, uh, what was the process of making this film? must have been exhaustive to put together something that, uh, you know, en encapsulates a man who did so much. It was an exhaustive process. I mean, I was lucky to spend uh, quite a bit of time with him on, on and off in the last five years of his life and do a lot of interviews with him. And so you really started this process well before he passed away. Yes, yeah. long before. And I, and I went to Italy with him and I went on a few trips with him to the East Coast and to Cuba. And um, But, you know, then I also spent an enormous amount of time going through the archives of all the interviews he'd done over many years, including radio. And that was a fascinating process to me. Uh, you know, going through that material whilst going back and rereading all his essays and sort of putting together the sort of political timeline. I really wanted the film to be politically mm. driven and be sort of America through Gore's eyes, mm. as well as obviously his biography and, and touching on many of his work as a writer, which, you know, the, the film could have been three times as sure. long. Sure. Gore had an incredibly <laughs> interesting and full life on yeah. many, many facets. Of it. Well, the film, the Gore Vidal, sure. The United States of Amnesia, opens at the New Art Theater in Los Angeles this Friday and it opens at the Opera Plaza in San Francisco and the Shattuck in Berkeley on June 13th. That's a week from tomorrow. You can find out more at gorevidaldocumentary.com. Nicholas, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here.